Martha Stewart is the perfect example of what happens if you marry or date the wrong man. Um, this documentary is fascinating. My God, this, this documentary proves so many of the points. One, her dad, her dad was a, um, Hobo schedule, hobo schedule, okay? So of course, of course, she ended up with a more ambitious, um, wealthier king baby, okay? Who actually held down a job, but they both, but this is, oh man, okay, let's get it. Before we do, let me remind you to please join my Patreon. I do lives over there with amazing people, authors, uh, some of my mutuals, travel content. Do I just hang out with people on Zoom. We, I do so much over there and that's how me and my mutuals, especially moving forward, how we're probably gonna be able to, the only way we'll be able to pay rent. So if they ban these apps or just shadow ban us, at least if you follow us even in the free tiers, um, you can at least uh, like not lose us in the chaos. So also wanna remind you of Operation Fem Free. It is a call to action for the holidays and everything. Uh, me and my mutuals have set this up. And if you know any wealthy donors who want to help support creators who are probably going to get shadow banned or just like whatever, um, uh, send them our way because uh, anyone know wealthy women who want to support other women, please send them our way. Links to both, uh, all of that is, our, is in my uh, caption. So there's so many topics I would love to cover that this uh, documentary talks about. I'm going to try to focus on just one aspect of it in this video. Like, I would love to talk about the way that the, the, the issues of domestic labor, emotional labor, invisible labor, and all those things. I think that's going to be a separate video, though some may be like tied into this. But I really want to talk about the, the aspect of how Martha ended up this way and how men continued to disappoint her and, and, and also women how um, women who enable men, men, women who center men, um, you know, end up doing so much work and they never end up really benefiting from it in the end. Because you, it's like, a, it's like, it's like, uh, it's like a deal with the devil. It's like selling your soul and it is thankless. And in the, at the end of the day, you're stuck with like um, a, a loser who doesn't really love you anyway. But okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, I always did it. I never liked her. I thought she's a big old birch. Um, and now I know why. I mean, I think I again. I think it's unethical to be a billionaire unless you're just giving your money away a, a, as much as you can. Um, I d I'm not against. I am not for any. I'm not here to defend Martha Stewart at all. I uh, don't know her. Don't care. But I'm using this to teach some other stuff. And this is the woman who basically got, became a billionaire from homemaker corn, essentially. Um, and she legit, she basically uh, showed all that's behind what goes on in the home and being a perfectionist and all that stuff. And I think the little, the, the perfect, perfect, perfect. Um, I think that's a whole nother video in itself. There's so many of the things I talk about are in this documentary. Now, and especially if you watch Cecilia Regina's videos about this, the new wife of Martha's ex-husband has come out saying that she was abusive and all that stuff. That could be true. I don't know. Um, all I know is that the, 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 the current wife is kind of making herself look terrible. So anyway, but uh, I don't know the truth. No one knows the truth. But I will know that, I do know that, you know, the media has constantly de portrayed her as a birch, um, a perfectionist, which she admits to, and a control freak, which I, I think it's fair to say she is. Like, this is her response to that kind of criticism. Yeah. So one of the questions that they keep coming back to in this documentary is like her idea around perfectionism and where she got it. And it's very clear where she got it, her dad. And so they interviewed all these different people and, you know, they're saying like she bought into the idea of perfection. Is, is, the question is not whether perfection is attainable, although I think it's like not attainable, but what, at what cost? Before I get into the story about her dad, it's so funny, like Martha Stewart is just a walking contradiction, but all, aren't all humans, all humans are. Y'all, look at this hat, by the way. <laughs> um... So she was talking about things she doesn't like. She doesn't like weight, doesn't like inefficiency, avoidance, which is so funny because she also talks about, she she hates talking about feelings. She avoids her feelings, but she hates avoidance. You know what I mean? Like she is full of contradictions, just like every human being. Um, she uh, doesn't like impatience. I dislike people who think they can do more than they can do. <laughs> if I give, if there's one thing that Martha is, it is that she is a workhorse. <laughs> 
<laughs> she is like a force of nature that can't be stopped. Now, um, that can be both a an asset an, an asset and a liability. And she is she is the representation of so many of these these like internalized things of capitalism and you know, white supremacy culture, right? Because that's all about perfectionism and either or and this black and white thinking. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I, I've mentioned it in several videos this last week. There's like the tenets of it. And, um, but anyway, uh, this idea of never being able to rest, you know, like all these things and patriarchy is absolutely tied into her mindset. And yet at the same time, she's also like working within the system and trying to like, push against the system but then like whatever anyway it's fascinating even the way she talks about her dad you know her dad like she I, I it's she almost she seems to really idealize her father in a way that kind of explains how she ended up with such terrible partner she doesn't like people who uh, were not paying attention to details even though she pays a little maybe too much attention to details then also dismisses details like the fact that you know she kind of blows off the fact that she had an affair <laughs> but you know like she doesn't like people who are being mean just to be mean but she's been accused of being really mean um and yet at the same time it sounds like her dad was a very mean person actually she says he was hold on i'm getting ahead of myself just like a lot of us um, it's not, it seems like Martha hasn't done a lot of that inner work and it's very, you know, our generation is not known for really going to therapy and dealing with this work. Not saying that all people in that generation don't, but I'm just saying it is, there's, <laughs> this generation is so resistant to dealing with what may be driving their behavior. And also it wasn't, a therapy wasn't a big thing back then. And it was definitely not like, it was, it was not as mainstream. It's not as accessible. It's still not accessible for a lot of people. But it's so funny to hear her talk about things she really, really believes in. And then she actually does those things, the opposite of those things and whatever. It's fascinating. The contradictions, the contradictions. Then she gives this speech. If you want to be... <laughs> Um, I really think a lot of women um, can learn from her, like some good lessons, but also take those with a grain of salt because mm, she definitely is not someone you want to idolize. But she does give some pretty um, interesting advice based on her lived experience. Like if you want to be happy for a year, get married. If you want to be happy for a decade, get a dog. If you want to be happy for the rest of your life, make a garden. Now she only had one marriage and it was a long time and it did not go well. But she had two men who really screwed her over romantically. She just didn't marry the second one. And uh, that didn't work out well for her either. So she did. It's like she explored all the options. Or she, she lived all the ways that men can ruin your life. Her father, uh, her first husband, and the, the, the second guy she dated for 15 years. Like she didn't marry him. But like, so you, d this idea that like, okay, I'm not going to get married that didn't work out well for her either. Just dating a man and having a relation. Like, anyway, I'll get to that in a bit. So, uh, throughout this whole thing, she's a, she, she is admittedly a perfectionist. And like I said, let, we're trying to get away from that. It's good to have a high standard. It's, a good, it's good to hold yourself accountable. It's good to strive for better. But perfectionism, that is, a, that is, that is th this, this is her. And she, you know, she's not a healthy person. And then she says, and it runs in my, in the family. And it started with my father. Her whole, like her description of her father. And you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure a lot was cut out. So we are also only getting what the editor and the director and, you know, the interviewers questions. Like there's so many things that are telling her story. And she was actually not really happy with this documentary. If I have time, I'll get to that either in this video or another one. Um, but you know what? If I had, if I was famous and I had someone make a document documentary about me, it would not be a man. I tell you that. Um, not saying that a woman wouldn't have bring into this, these patriarchal ideas and that a woman couldn't make it make it just not represent who you are. But like she complained about the camera angle. She was like, there was three different cameras. Why he chose the worst camera angles? You know, and any woman who 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 is you know, looking at herself in the mirror all the time knows that like the double chin thing, right? Like if you, if you want to get rid of that, you go a little bit above, you know, like, and that's why a lot of times if you ever ask someone to take a photo of you, you don't, it's rare that you ask a man because they don't like think about, they're not obsessed with their image as much as women traditionally have been forced to be. 
So then she goes into this story about her father, how he made them all learn how to garden. And she's bragging about how he could grow anything. And she's really trying to like, she seems to have a really good idea of her dad. Like she brags about him all the time. And then she'll say these one-liners and you're like, what? So she also talks about how she was the ideal daughter. So I think there were six children and she was the second. Now, I forgot to look this up, but I don't know if the oldest was a son or a daughter. So, but she definitely is stuck in oldest daughter syndrome. Um, and we'll get to that in a second. She says, I wanted to learn. He had a lot to teach and I listened. And I was the one that <laughs> trusted to iron his linen shirts. So like even the stuff she's saying, I'm like, okay, um, we've got... Um, Daddy's little girl, uh, we've got the favorite child. We've got the um, adultification of children. Uh, we got oldest daughter syndrome or older daughter syndrome. Why the hell is she ironing his shirts? I mean, I know why. And this is also a different era, right? But, you know, you would expect to hear that the, 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 the mom was ironing his shirts. And the mom also had a job like outside the home because being in the home is also a never ending thankless job but the fact that she was he she was the one trusted trusted the phrase the phrasing of that is so fun to iron his shirt she seemed like proud of that instead of like being like it's kind of messed up my dad you know favored me i was his favorite um and he trusted me only me with his shirt I am telling you, anytime you have a father who is treating one of the daughters all special, um, some of this I, I, I say from experience, that is not a good thing. That creates conflict between siblings. That also, sometimes there's something else going on within the family, but that's another video about why that child is the, is the favorite. Lots of reasons. But in this particular case, it's because Martha reminded him of himself. My father was the handsomest father. He loved me. <laughs> it was very obvious to everybody that I was his favorite. Cool. Great. I bet that your siblings loved that. And that's how, I mean, this is like, I'm not going to call her dad a narcissist because patriarchy kind of the same, it does the same thing with whiteness. Patriarchy makes men the center of everything. And so they behave as they're the center of everything. And the entitlement and the selfishness that comes with that, that system of oppression and that entitlement to free labor and, and being the sun and everyone has to orbit around you, right? So that's how like... The same thing is like, you know, a cishet person is, is centered and thinks, sees the world only through our vision until we are, you know, forced to or asked to or care to um, think about the lived experiences of everyone else, right? Who is not cishet. Whoever's the default is kind of going to think and behave a little bit like a narcissist or a lot like one, but that doesn't mean they are like, you know, like... My dad had not, was diagnosed in the 70s with it. So I actually do know narcissists very well, but don't think just because someone is entitled and selfish and gaslights and does all this stuff doesn't mean that they're a narcissist technically, right? But we do know that men act like this um, in terms of like, they just, they want a mini me. They want a legacy. They want to live, the, and, and moms do this too. All parents can do this. Men have a pretty bad reputation of doing this a lot of the men who do this aren't even parenting those children right I know like mothers will like literally a lot of times make their daughters be in the beauty pageants and the cheerling and all that stuff and so I'm not saying this is just dad I'm just saying dads will like literally not parent at all and then also expect you to be a little mini me you know what I mean he thought I was more like him than the other children again that's why he favorited her probably a lot of times the one that the 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 fathers or the or the mother or whatever parent uh favors is the one that looks the most like them <laughs> so the interviewer says and it's a male interviewer too by the way so again like i don't even trust the, a man interviewing me because they're not going to ask the right questions um if they don't understand these systems but whatever um in what way well he was a perfectionist okay this is where like some sort of cognitive dissonance is going on here so this is where like the like you are saying the opposite things. It, it, it comes really, it comes apparent. He got the job done that he could, that he was set out to do. Not his work work. <laughs> he was, uh, he was a failure at work. <laughs> this is where he starts to show up. <laughs> he could have done pretty much anything he wanted to do. And he was stuck in a salesman job. You know what, Martha? I think your dad said that a lot. 
I'm guessing her dad is the one who probably was just like, you know, I was, I, this is like the classic hobo schedule now that's like an entrepreneur and stays at home and does nothing and plays video games and thinks about this company he's going to make while you work your butt off. That is what this is. And he probably convinced Martha that the only reason why he his failure at work is because no one understands his value. No one really appreciates how, what a genius he is and he's stuck as a salesman, a stupid salesman, he's better than that. So instead of, you know, going for that thing, he's just going to not work, which is what he did. He sometimes, and then she says, he sometimes started the day off with a huge glass of coffee and red wine. So is this an alcoholic? Maybe. Yeah, it sounds like it, Mark. It sound like a hobo who had a drinking problem and didn't want to work. And so you and the whole rest of the family did everything. But he really loved you. But, you know, just like a lot of people, she, you know, maybe she doesn't understand what alcoholism looks like, you know, because he never looked like a drunk. He never stumbled around and threw things and broke things. That wasn't my father. But he was a dissatisfied, unhappy human being. That sounds a lot like an alcoholic. Now, as somebody who's had my own uh, issues with addiction, and I know people with addiction, um, whether they're drinking or not, they are usually dissatisfied, unhappy human beings because it's a much deeper problem. Um, and so whether he was stumbling around and yelling and throwing your mom against the, uh, the wall, or he just drank every day because he was a victim and a victim and a victim and felt like no one appreciated. I don't know. That sounds a lot like untreated alcoholism or whatever addiction. It is literally alcohol and these kinds of things are usually the solution for a much deeper problem. And so this guy sounds like miserable to be around, to be honest. But, you know, that's kind of the, the kind of thinking that children have to do is if the, the, one of the parents in the home, um, you know, we, the, we have to do all kinds of like mental, emotional gymnastics to justify that this person really loves us. They don't work. They're mean. They have a very high standard. They're professionals. They're in a bad mood all the time. Never really, you know, and then, you know, make me iron their shirts and do all this stuff for them. But they really, really, really love me. And I'm their favorite, <laughs> you know. He couldn't support his six kids. And we needed food. This is like, there seems to be... I don't know, and it's not that, like, I understand relationships with parents are very, you know what I mean? I, uh, I, I had a very difficult relationship with my dad, with no contact for a while, then kind of made peace, and, like, whatever. These are complicated relationships, okay? But, the like, there just seems to be, I don't know, maybe she, it was edited out. But the way she talks about him and how he just loved him and she just really admired this man, and yet he was a loser, you know? He's got six children who need to eat and he's too good to be a salesman so he does nothing so they had garden and we would trade <laughs> for goods that we couldn't grow so like basically he was like nah, i'm too good for sales jobs or whatever or maybe he was fired for i mean he could have gotten fired he could have lost his job for drinking i don't know but he the, the garden at home became the big project so the the reason why she is so good at gardening and obsesses over gardening and this stuff kind of makes sense but because she was his favorite she's really into gardening because you got to please daddy you want daddy to love you right but he, he stood over you like a like a sergeant i mean this is the photo used <laughs> and she said he's mean he was a mean person so again she doesn't like people who are mean just for the sake of being mean but I think she also thinks that him, the way he was mean was good because it taught her how to garden and it got them to work hard on their gardening. So it's kind of, I kind of understand why she doesn't like mean people but justifies her own meanness because it is for a better good, right? I do like how she's very direct and blunt. So that's why people love her is because she is like so not the people pleaser or whatever. But she basically seems to be kind of what I turned into when I was in the in the, the boys clubs in the outdoor adventure world um, not so much by the time I got into comedy in film I realized that I felt dead inside from literally trying to you know be you know if you can't beat them join them mentality of working in the boys clubs but she reminds me a lot of myself she's the cool girl she is the cool girl that then also made an empire out of domesticity right now I did not adopt this like meanness 
Um, what I ended up doing was making like really crass, ridiculous jokes. Uh, I made, I make kind of thought I was better than other women. Like we all, these are all adapt. We, 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 we do this to adapt to patriarchy, but in the end it doesn't work out well, you know? And that's why anybody who's worked in corporate, um, from my understanding is that some of the women in corporate end up being just like men but sometimes worse and worse and more ruthless because we're just doing what men would do, but in a dress. And then if you also have like, if within white supremacy culture, a lot of times women who look like me end up being like worse than like the white male bosses because um, we've got a couple things going on in terms of allegiance to patriarchy and like white supremacy culture. So apparently he would just shout, it's like, this, 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 this picture is so perfect. He's just sitting in his chair you know, like an arms, you know, just, what is it, arm stool, whatever. Just sit in his chair being like, yeah, that's not right. La, la, la. You know, little, little hobo who's not working. He's just barking orders at his kids who shouldn't be working, right? They're working because he's not. Provider protector, my butt. He would give us an order. Weed the tomato. And this is her brother talking here. And if we didn't follow through, we paid the penalty. While Martha called her dad mean, and again, this could be all edited out, her brother had a very different, you know, it was just more like, yeah, like abusive. We had our whippings, it was the yardstick. We dreaded the yardstick. And at times it was the end of the belt. Now, again, this was more common back in the day, but like, this is a man who's just sitting in his chair, barking orders like a sergeant, Martha's words, to go do all this work. Again, so he doesn't have to. Um, then beats them if they don't do it perfectly. The brother, uh, this Eric, one of the brothers says, to this day, I despise gardening. So shocker, the triangulation of the big king baby dad, you know, pivot, up, you know, like Martha is just like him, right? So she's going to be just like him and loves the thing. This is the equivalent of like a daughter having a dad obsessed with football. Now I've watched football with my dad, but I never pretended like I hated it because I hated it. I will never watch American football again if I don't have to, because I hate it. So many of my childhood years were robbed for me because I sat next to him, watched the stupid game just to be close to my dad. But and a, a Martha Stewart version of that would be the daughter who has, you know, like who has the Steelers. Uh, I mean, you can see it at games. The, the girls who will do anything to spend time with dad and the, and a lot of times those dads just wanted a boy so bad it's like sometimes they do have boys and maybe the boys aren't into it or whatever um but the dad who just wanted a mini me so bad and the girls who desperately just want to spend time with a dad who doesn't seem interested in them at all will have you know the face face pain and they go to every game and i'm not saying that women don't have an interest in sports on their own and that all women who are into sports a lot that it's about their daddy issues i'm not saying that at all but you know what I'm talking about. Any woman who, is with, who grew up with an unavailable father and you see the sons do it all the time. They don't even know why they have an allegiance to a team or gardening, right? But they just love it. Why? Because it was the only time they could spend with their father. So many dads, they'll never go to the mall. They'll never do any, like any of the stuff that's like not interesting to them. They won't do it. So the daughters end up having to do whatever it is their dads are into. And sometimes they build an empire on it. So Martha goes on to talk about he lost, he had lost his job. We don't we don't find out why. Could be because he's drinking wine before work every day. It could be because he was you know a victim of whatever and just didn't do a good job because he thought he was too good for the company. Either way, this man didn't work. He had no money saved. Great job being provider, daddy. Mind you, this was back in the day when women couldn't have credit cards yet. Right? Like there were women and, 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 and no fault divorce, I'm pretty sure was, was, was not a thing yet. I forget exactly what year that came. And that's probably coming back by the way, <laughs> or I mean them getting rid of it. The fact that this man was living in a time where, um, you know, it would like women couldn't get just divorce, you know, and a lot of women were cut out of jobs, right? The, and, and, and couldn't actually get, you know, loans. They couldn't get credit cards. They were really dependent on these providers and he had no money saved six children and just didn't want to work so six kids and they needed money so what happened the parentified older daughter steps in to do what her dad should have been doing which is working so apparently there was this girl from across the street 
who uh, spent her free time modeling. They convinced Martha to get into this. You're pretty enough to be a model. What would, would you like to be introduced? She started off at $15 an hour, which, I mean, this was what? Oh my God, I can't even do the math. This was so many decades ago. <laughs> like $15 an hour is like not even, you know what? I just looked it up. So Martha was born in 1941. I said, okay, maybe this was like 1957 that she would have been doing this. Maybe even earlier. $15 an hour in 1957 was equivalent to the purchase power of $168.50. So this... This teenager was making $168 an hour while her dad was sitting in a folding chair in the yard barking orders at everybody to grow food, to eat, because he wasn't working, which was a lot better than the 50 cents I was getting babysitting. Side note, I looked this up. Uh, after it was 10, this is on Wikipedia. She worked as the occasional babysitter for the children of Mickey Mantle and Yoga Barra. Like all these people, <laughs> Yankee. And at 15, she started modeling. So they have some of these clips from the things she was <laughs> odor-proof your body. Wow, things really haven't changed much, right? How much you want to bet this is targeted towards women? Better not smell, especially down there. Maybe you should douche. <laughs> so uh, she wasn't like a supermodel, but it was good money. And everybody in her town was like, wow, Martha's a model. So again, admittedly not a supermodel, but I was certainly successful. And this right here. I would give most of my paycheck to my mother. Why didn't you give it to your dad? The provider. The head of the household. Why not give that money to dad? Maybe he was terrible at money. Um, And maybe he would have spent it all on alcohol. Or, you know, no telling what. Whatever. Hobbies. And then we're using uh, the family's money for hobbies back then, too. We have a 15-year-old who is paying the bills because her little hobo daddy doesn't want to work. The kids are starving and eating out of this garden because they have to make their own food. Like! Because they still had young children at home. So Martha has been fully parentified at this point. It is her and her mother taking care of the six children that the dad that loved her so much created well helped create and it was her mother that made sure we always had good food she was such a good cook so martha stood by her mother's side in the kitchen and learned a lot of this stuff right learned everything she could so she learned how to be mean and how to bark orders at people and be a perfectionist from her dad you know i'm not saying her dad's an evil man nobody is good or bad but it seems like a lot of the things that ended up uh a kind of a toxically masculine um, feminist. And I just, again, I love that she's direct. I love that she is not like, hey, I love that about her. But she has been accused of being very difficult to work. For. But at the same time, all women who are direct and who, you know what I mean? So this is a very nuanced conversation, okay? But the things that she learned from her dad, um, and since especially she was his favorite and, you know, kind of worshipped him, she took that in the business world. And unlike him, she actually wanted to work, you know? And of course she did. She's a woman. Like, women never question having to work. Unless you are literally born, like, into, like, so much wealth. But then you end up doing a lot of emotional work, no matter what. So not working tends to not ever be an option for women. Look at the retired women in your life. How many of them, even when they're retired, the moment they've been waiting for, are volunteering for like five different things or hosting all this crap and they literally don't know how to rest? Or start adopting a bunch of animals? Soon as the kids are grown, they get a dog. You know, something, always got to be taking care of someone, something, doing something, so, when, like, you know what I mean? There's so many men, despite what they say, just don't feel like they should have to work any more than absolutely necessary. Now men, some men work way too much. But the, the, there are more of these dudes out there than we want to talk about. And especially now. Which is why women are out, you know, getting better grades, going to college more, doing all this stuff. Because um, it, 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 we've been taught since we were born, most of us, anyone who was, who was uh, socialized as a woman... Right? This is across gender. But if you were treated like a woman or a girl, you know that resting is not an option. Because even if you're not doing paid labor, you're always going to do some labor. With your body, with your emotions, with your emotional intelligence, with managing people. And even though it's not paid, it still works. Her mom was a school teacher. So mom is 
working outside the home and inside the home and had to cook 16 meals a day. <laughs> I thought well, that was pretty fantastic that she could do all that. So Martha is like this weird combination of her mom and her dad. Uh, which makes sense. Aren't we all on some level? Unless like we really, or we can be the, the, a version of them, but just the opposite. Because a lot of times, if we haven't really done this hard work um, that takes a long time, is that, and I used to do this about a certain family member. I was like, I'm not going to be that person. I'm not, I'm not. And I started defining who I was by who I was not. And that is still not necessarily the healthiest way to approach because you're still centering that person and who they are rather than who you are, you know? But the, the cookie cutter house and the cookie cutter life, that was not for me. Ah, which is so funny because that's what she ended up selling. <laughs> so then she gets a scholarship right because she doesn't come from money. She's literally having to grow the food she eats. Now granted she does come with white privilege and and all clearly she was in a, in a neighborhood or like around people with money and power she still has a lot of privileges right out of the gate but she wasn't born into wealth or maybe even if she was her dad seems to not be able to hold on to any money she gets a scholarship to bernard which is you know they believe that's uh, the the women ver version of uh, columbia or whatever and it's here it's here that she meets the next man that's going to kind of try to ruin her life um but the, 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 nothing seems to stop this woman but i'm gonna make the the next part about her ex-husband part two because this all makes so much sense that she may not have ended up with a little hobo but she ended up with the same person they're all on the king baby hobo hobo schedule spectrum some just don't want to make money at all and they don't want to work at all and some are very successful but will still offload as much labor onto you and exploit as much free labor from you as possible and that's still kind of homosexual these two these two still have hold on i can't get them on my fingers these two are the same person in terms of the level of entitlement um and selfishness the the details just look a little different and we'll talk about this man in part two let me know if you want to hear part two Please follow my Patreon and check out FemFreeze. All those links are in my uh, caption. And let me know if you heard the comment song. Welcome, welcome to the comment song. Dating app edition. Yes, these are photos from the times I was on the apps. Look at, look at, look at, look at these men. They're just like, hey, I hate you, I hate you. And just in case you didn't know, I can also take your life like that. Hey, welcome, welcome to the comment song. Then can't stand you edition. Welcome, welcome to the comment song. Another reason to get off the apps. Hey, uh, they were way back better back then when I was on them and yet terrifying <laughs> some of them were just plain weird like what the hell what the hell this is the comment song where I do random stuff just for fun look at this guy look at this guy this is honestly something that gives me nightmares still 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 haunts me in my nightmares nightmares like I mean it's kind of funny but what the hell what, what kind of woman wants to date this or a piece of mm -hmm, literally literally selling yourself like you're a piece of crap hey uh, these men i swear they don't even take this seriously obviously like the stuff made me laugh of course but come on this is a dating app hey hey like maybe put this is your fourth or fifth picture just to be funny but not your first then you got people like this and I don't know. I don't know. Whatever. I think I'm so glad the dating apps are not my thing anymore. Like, look at this. Look at this guy. He literally messaged me on OkCupid. Okay but that's because you could just message anyone that you didn't even match with. I hate it. Anyway, anyway, maybe these men hate us. Not all men, but enough. Uh, let me know if you heard the comment song, Tender Edition. Eh, voila.